Hello and welcome to the sixth in my series of presentations on the conflict between science and creationism. Today I'm going to be talking about the beginning of life with the subject of abiogenesis, literally how life arose from non-living parts. As ever, I'm basing my talk today on the slide presentations of the infamous young earth creationist Kent Hovind. This means I'm going to respond to points raised in his slides, so I won't cover all of this topic by any means, just the bits that are relevant to the creationist claims. Lots of these arguments are dealt with in the wonderful archive on talkorigins.org. Please search for their extremely detailed site and read their much more thorough rebuttals of these claims. You can find many of the arguments that I've used here on that site, however I've added a few extra bits here to bring the coverage up to date. So let's get started. Abiogenesis covers the process by which life arose from non-living origins. So what we're dealing with here is still not the topic of evolution, this is really just organic chemistry. Yes, I appreciate we're on presentation 6 here and we've still not even begun to talk about evolution. Bear with me, we'll get there eventually. A lot of the controversy here is based on what we can define as life. What is life? Where is the dividing line? Personally, I don't see any dividing line whatsoever according to our intrinsic understanding of alive, except for those conforming to arbitrary collections of properties. The only real dividing line to me is between those organisms able to self-replicate and those not able to do so. I don't think it's possible to create any real intrinsic separation between replicators on this level until we start discriminating based on sexual versus asexual reproduction or on the actual physical properties of cells. Arguments against this area of science generally fall into one of three possible camps. The important tactic is not to get boxed into arguing about this on the specific details of the exact conditions of the ancient earth. Nobody knows what those are, and it's all speculation with greater or lesser degrees of evidence. Unless you fully understand organic chemistry and know exactly what the latest studies show about atmospheric chemistry and ultraviolet radiation, then I suggest you stay away from this area of discussion. Otherwise, creationists tend to massively exaggerate this as a cause for concern, and they will probably use specific arguments based on complex points of chemistry that you won't be able to answer. Yes, and this is a very important point. Science has the guts to say we don't know. More than that, science is compelled to say we don't know, whenever we don't have enough evidence to support our theories. We're okay with that, and so should you be. So with that caveat, let's look at a few specific topics. One of the most famous experiments often quoted in relation to the beginning of life on Earth is the Miller-Urey experiment. Stanley Miller and Harold Urey were biochemists in the University of Chicago, and in 1952-53 they designed and carried out an experiment to attempt to replicate the atmosphere that existed in the primordial Earth to see if it was conducive to the formation of the organic molecules required for life to begin. Their hypothesis was that they could gather together a mixture of water, methane, ammonia and hydrogen, which the experimenters expected to replicate the early atmosphere. They then injected energy into this mixture by passing an electrical current through it in order to replicate the conditions of heat and solar energy that were present billions of years ago. After this experiment had been left running for a week, Miller and Urey noticed that about one-eighth of the carbon in the system had been converted to organic compounds, with 2% of it forming amino acids. Amino acids are the so-called building blocks of life. There are 20 of them in the human body that are used to make up the strands of protein from which we're all formed. So for more than half of the amino acids required for life to be produced just by passing a current through some gases for a week is remarkable. The Miller-Urey experiment was the first in a series of experiments designed to simulate the early atmosphere. We now know that the atmosphere was likely different to how it was portrayed in 1953, but more recent experiments with a more realistic mixture have been able to produce all the amino acids required for life. In fact, amino acids are a doddle to create. 19 of the 20 required for life have been found in just one meteorite that fell from the sky in Australia in 1969. Let's have a quick look at the apparatus that Miller and Urey used. This is the apparatus used in the famous experiment. The simulated ocean on the right of this image contains a reservoir of water with a heat source underneath. Water vapour moves upwards from this location, through the glass tube, into the spark chamber, where a continuous electric current is passed through it. The gas then passes through a condenser beneath this, which is a location where the vapour is cooled down in order to condense it into liquid once more. And then the cycle plugs back into the ocean again. So the device simulates a simple kind of water cycle. It's crude, but the aim of the experiment was merely to investigate what chemicals could be produced, if any, in a simulated primordial environment. There are of course many objections to the original experiment, and those which followed it, so let's take a look at some of those. 
Many of the complaints about the Miller-Urey experiment and those like it revolve around the concept of a reducing atmosphere. This was an assumption that was initially made as it was believed at the time of the experiment to be a good match to the primordial atmosphere on Earth. However, later studies have suggested that this may not have been the case, and hence that the Miller-Urey experiment may be invalid. A reducing atmosphere is one that is low in free oxygen and high in hydrogen. This is important because oxygen is very reactive, so if there's any of it around, it's very difficult to form stable compounds required for the origin of life. The creationist claim is that there was actually plenty of oxygen around in the early atmosphere, and therefore that life could not have arisen by the methods that scientists claim. Note, incidentally, how easily they switch from the Earth is less than 10,000 years old to in the early Earth the atmosphere would have been oxygen rich, but I digress. Actually, there is a substantial body of evidence that the early atmosphere was not rich in oxygen, but was in fact very oxygen poor, as well as being fairly high in hydrogen, exactly as required. Some of the evidence in favour of a reducing early atmosphere is 1. Banded iron formations are found abundantly in rocks around 2.3 to 2.4 billion years ago, occasionally before this time and for a while after, but then very rarely after that. Banded iron formations are formed by incompletely oxidised iron deposits, which can be used as a marker for a low oxygen concentration in the atmosphere. It seems likely that photosynthetic unicellular life started creating oxygen in the oceans sometime before about 2.5 billion years ago. This new oxygen caused the iron in the oceans to precipitate out and then to form into layers. Differing amounts of free oxygen would have caused differing precipitation rates, and hence the bands. Once the oxygen levels were high enough and substantial amounts of iron had been removed from the oceans, the process stopped. Some younger deposits are found, but they are rare and perhaps relate to bizarre localised conditions. 2. To back up this evidence, there is also the case of uraninite. This is a mineral that cannot form in an oxygen-rich atmosphere. Again, there's lots of it prior to 2.5 billion years ago and very little since. There are some deposits younger than this, which has been pointed out by creationists, but they tend to be found in rapid deposition environments where the rock formed very quickly and hence the minerals didn't have a chance to get exposed to the atmosphere for very long. Plenty of the older deposits are from very slowly formed rocks, so the presence of minerals in these rocks that could not be formed in the presence of substantial oxygen is a damning indictment of the non-reducing atmosphere theory. 3. Paleosoils, that is, fossil soils from older than about 2.5 billion years ago, these contain unoxidised cerium. Again, this is impossible to form if there's much oxygen around. 4. Finally, there are other minerals such as pyrite that simply cannot form in the presence of oxygen and are even more reactive than the ones I mentioned earlier. These are found unoxidised in rocks older than about 2.5 billion years, including in rocks that were clearly exposed to the surface for a very long time. For example, they show evidence for water erosion. The only sensible conclusion to draw from these many evidences is that the early atmosphere was reducing, i.e. it had very little oxygen in it, just as required for the beginning of life. However, I think that there's two very important corollaries here. Firstly, the Miller-Urey experiment is known to be an inaccurate model of the early atmosphere. We admit that. But more recent experiments with much more accurate models have replicated and extended these initial results. And secondly, the consensus opinion now is that the most likely place for life to have evolved in the early Earth is at the bottom of the ocean near hydrothermal vents. In this strange environment, the composition of the water is very much impacted by the composition of the volcanic material being spewed from the vents, and hence it's possible to get an extremely oxygen-poor and hydrogen-rich reducing environment with no problems whatsoever. The second potential problem concerning a reducing early atmosphere is that of ultraviolet radiation. On Earth, we're protected from the sun's deadly ultraviolet rays by the ozone layer, a thick layer of oxygen about 13 to 40 kilometres above the surface of the Earth that absorbs the vast majority of the incoming rays. Of course, in a reducing atmosphere, which, if you remember, has no oxygen, there can be no ozone layer. Hence, the early Earth would have been subject to a deadly bombardment of ultraviolet light, which would have broken down any simple organic life before it had the chance to evolve. So how do we get round this issue? As we've seen, the overwhelming scientific opinion, so widely accepted as to be taken for granted in most circumstances, is that the early atmosphere was very oxygen poor before about 2.5 billion years ago, after which point the life on Earth began to produce small amounts of oxygen. In fact, there is some evidence that oxygen production began earlier than this, maybe several hundred million years earlier, but the oxygen was absorbed into rocks which acted as the so-called oxygen sinks. Only when these sinks began to fill up did the atmospheric levels rise. So we know that the early atmosphere had no significant ozone layer, if any at all, 
and this would have overlapped with the existence of life on Earth. So how can we get round this problem? Well, there seem to be three solutions to this, all of which are supported by the evidence to some degree, so it is likely that some combination of all three is close to the truth. Firstly, the deleterious effect of ultraviolet radiation is probably much less than has been suggested. For a start, ultraviolet radiation is not very penetrating. A few metres of water or a few centimetres of soil or rock easily stop it in its tracks. So life in the oceans would have had very little to worry about. In fact, ultraviolet light can actually be a benefit for the formation of some chemicals, given its effects on organic molecules. It is likely that it formed some role in the origin of life, although it's not well known exactly what that role may have been. Secondly, it is likely that there were abundant methane and carbon dioxide particles in the early atmosphere that would have blocked out some of the UV radiation. Recent studies by Pavlov et al. in 2000 and Trainer and collaborators in 2004, for example, show that such conditions exist on Saturn's moon Titan and that the conditions for formation of a protective organic haze were satisfied by the primordial Earth. Thirdly, again, the most recent theories suggest that life probably developed near hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the oceans, way out of range of any ultraviolet radiation, so it doesn't really matter if the surface was bombarded with it, the early living molecules would never have noticed. Of course, as soon as life evolved the ability to generate oxygen, the tables turned, and substantial amounts of ozone would have been produced, generating the ozone layer that protects us to this day. The next objection is a classic chicken and egg scenario, where two processes require each other to operate, so it's difficult to see how either could have evolved on its own. The problem is quite simple, and at its heart is a process so fundamental that it's the basis of the entire cellular understanding of biology. DNA is the molecule that contains a pattern for the development of our body, and indeed the bodies of all other animals, plants, fungi and bacteria. In fact, DNA is the fundamental code used for all living things. It is so universal that it must have been one of the very first chemicals to evolve, right at the beginning of life on Earth. DNA works by providing a series of templates for the production of proteins, which are built inside human cells by a remarkable array of miniature apparatus specifically evolved for this purpose. But proteins act as catalysts for the function of DNA, building this cellular apparatus that causes the replication of the DNA. Without DNA we can't build proteins, but without proteins DNA cannot work, so we're left with a real problem here, or so it seems. As it happens, DNA is not a totally unique molecule. It has a sort of sister molecule called RNA, which is very similar in many respects. RNA also has four different kinds of bases, which are joined with a sugar backbone, just like DNA. However, in RNA, the place of the base thymine is replaced by uracil. In most other aspects, the two molecules are very similar or identical. In fact, some viruses use RNA instead of DNA as their primary genetic material indicating that the two molecules can perform similar functions. No organisms commonly classified as life use RNA for several reasons. Most importantly, RNA is not as stable as DNA and so is not suitable for building complex genetic codes. And secondly, RNA tends to occur in single strands rather than the famous double helix of DNA, meaning that it's not so easily and reliably replicated. However, RNA does have one major advantage over DNA, namely that it can auto-catalyse. That means that it can produce more copies of itself on its own, and it can catalyse that reaction itself. After all, most of the major structures in the cell that are used for replication of DNA are made from RNA. It's very good at that kind of thing. So what this means is that it's pretty much certain that RNA was a precursor to DNA, and that DNA evolved later after a complex selection of self-replicating RNA molecules had already formed. This is known as the RNA world hypothesis and is fairly widely accepted today. We'll cover it in more detail later on.